This is a short Hebrew introduction to my conversation with Mr. Brian Johnson. If you want, you can skip to the conversation itself on the timestamp below. Shalom lekulam, yesh po sicha merateket. Ba sicha azot dibarti imar Brian Johnson. Brian Johnson hu gam yazam, gam sofer, ve gam dmut merateket, ve yoter mikol, chamoti mikira oto, ve lo stam, ki aben adam azze הולך לחיות לנצח, או לפחות למות, תוך כדי שהוא מנסה לחיות לנצח. הדבר הזה הוא מטורף בעיניי, כי מה שהוא עושה זה לא רק אנטי-אייג'ינג, זה בעצם לנסות לעצור את תהליך ההזדקנות שלו, הוא עושה רוורס אנג'ין, לנסות להיות יותר צעיר ככל שהזמן עובר, הוא נולד ב-1977, והוא נראה יותר צעיר ממני, שזה אולי לא דבר כזה מרשים, אבל עדיין דבר מטורף. הבן אדם הזה גם לא הזוי. זאת אומרת, יש לו חברות סטארט-אפ, הוא מכר אותן במיליוני דולרים, והוא משקיע המון זמן, כסף, אנרגיה ומחקר, כדי להבין את המנגנונים שפועלים בגוף שלו, גם מהצד ההוליסטי, וגם כל איבר ואיבר. הוא אמר לי למשל, שהגוף שלו, המדדים הביולוגיים שלו, זה המדדים שהכי הרבה נמדדו אי פעם. זאת אומרת, אף גוף אנושי לא נמדד ולא נותר בצורה כל כך קפדנית כמו הגוף של בריין. ג'ונסון. כמה תובנות מדהימות שעלו מהשיחה הזאת זה א', בפעם הראשונה בהיסטוריה של האנושות מוות זה אולי. וזה מחזיר אותנו לרעיון של ישעיהו ליבוביץ' שהמוות לא מוסבר דרך מנגנון החיים. הדבר השני זה שהמשחק הגדול ביותר שהאנושות משחקת זה אל תמות. הוא אומר המשחק הזה משחקים אותו כל הזמן, כל הזמן, כל האנושות, הרבה יותר מדת. השיחה הזאת באמת גרמה לי לחשוב על כל כך הרבה דברים, יש לו ערוץ יוטיוב ענק והוא בתוך הערוץ מסביר על הסדר יום שלו, על מה הוא צריך לעשות כדי להגיע לאן שהוא מגיע, והסדר יום והתזונה מאוד מאוד קפדנית ולפי דעתי לא כל כך עושה חשק לאכול, שלא באמת מעלה לך את השאלה האם היית רוצה לחיות לנצח כאשר זה מה שאתה צריך לעשות בשביל לחיות לנצח. אני חייב להגיד לכם ש... פעם ראשונה שקרה לי שקיבלתי רק 20 דקות לשוחח עם אורח שלי כי הוא כנראה בן אדם מאוד מאוד עסוק זה לא קרה לי אף פעם אבל גם בתוך ה-20 דקות היה מאוד מאוד מרתק אני בטוח ששמעתם עליו ואם לא שווה לכם לחפש בריין ג'ונסון ביוטיוב לראות קצת על הבן אדם המאוד מאוד מרשים הזה ועכשיו מיסטר בריין ג'ונסון Brian Johnson, I think it's going to be a, one of the shortest interviews I ever conducted, so let's try to be very focused. Uh, I think that Freddie Mercury used to have a song, Why Do We Need to Live Longer? Why Do You Want to Live Longer? And do you understand people who say, I'm not into this longevity thing, I, I don't want to live longer, I want this yeah. materialistic hell to end soon? Yeah, I mean, so... To answer that question, I'd like to do a thought experiment. Let's imagine we travel in time one million years ago, and we're there with Homo erectus. And we, Homo erectus has an ax in their hand, and we say, Homo erectus, tell us, where do you find food? Where do you find shelter? And where is danger? We're going to listen to all those answers. But if we say, Homo erectus, tell us about the future evolutionary potential of the species, we're going to laugh. We don't think that Homo erectus is going to be able to tell us about quantum mechanics. or about special relativity, or about holding these magic boxes in our hands that allow us to call anyone in the world, or of the microscopic world. Homo erectus would have no idea about our modern abilities. And the question I pose here is, when we contemplate questions of the future, are we actually qualified to answer them? Or are we the equivalent of Homo erectus? Are we basically cavemen and incapable of even stating our own future preferences? Yes, but one can say, okay, there are two meanings to the word we in your uh, presupposition. One is we as humanity, which is, I absolutely agree with you. And second, we is myself, Roy and you, Brian, which can be totally different thing. Okay? Humanity, if we're talking about humanity, you know, the, 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 the entire thing that encapsulates humanity, you're absolutely right. But may, you know, we, ne- we are not... qualify to even think about living longer because we are not familiar with the concept. So how can you manifest the concept into nowadays life when we say, okay, in order to do what Brian do, I need to very vastly change my way of uh, eating yeah. and diet and everything 
is it worth it? And maybe we are yeah. not capable of answering this very question. Is it worth it? Well, the difference here is that if you were to ask that question even 20 years ago, let alone 200 years or 300 years ago, when death was absolutely inevitable, then you could come up with all these clever arguments of, you know, live fast, die young, death gives life meaning, like all the, you know, all the reasons people explain for death. But this is moment, this moment is the first time in history where death is maybe. And that is because we are baby steps away from superintelligence. So it is entirely a brand new way of thinking about a technical and medical reality that just became possible. And like all previous forms of innovation, when it first lands, it has an effect at confusing people. They don't know how to think. They don't know what to say. They don't know how to fill. And so to fill that void, they fill it with whatever thing that comes to their mind. But it's not well thought out. It's not a conclusive opinion. It's just trying to say, this is a new idea. I kind of feel uncomfortable with the new idea. I don't know what else to say. So I'm going to say what I've said in the past. But it really, these words don't mean anything. It's just the process of humans getting familiar with a new concept that may become a new reality. And again, what you said just now is, is mind-blowing. Again, for the first time in history, death is a maybe. And one of mm -hmm. the greatest philosophers in Israel, we, he, which was also a biochemist, said there is nothing in the process of life that explains death. So this is something very strange, and the science of longevity, and this is basically what we are heading to, the science of longevity is just mind-blowing. So uh, if you can just summarize in, 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 in three minutes, what nowadays, like uh, 2024, we know about longevity, and again, when we say longevity, we mean live longer, but not in the way that we do it in elderly homes, but live longer in a healthy a vibrant, yes. vital way. Yes? That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and people thinking about timeframes like 120 or forever, it breaks the human brain. Homo sapien brains cannot understand that concept. What we can understand is tomorrow. And we can understand waking up and not feeling pain in our body. We can understand being able to do all the physical activities we care about. We can understand you know, all, you know, having, <laughs> being able to see things in front of us, not to be sick. I mean, health is forgotten until it's the only thing that matters. And so the entirety of what I'm trying to do with Blueprint is we've seen throughout history where when one indiv individual accomplishes something that people previously thought was impossible, all of a sudden, everyone else can do it. And that's what I'm trying to demonstrate is that if it's possible to dramatically slow and even reverse some aging damage, and I can be the example person in 2024, others are going to be able to do it as well. And if you can take this moment in time, so imagine this thought experiment. Imagine we could whisper in the ear of those who lived in 1870. We would say, pay attention to new ideas around the idea of microscopic objects being the source of infection. When doctors perform surgeries and they don't wash their hands, or when they have instruments they don't clean between delivering babies, that causes infection, which then causes death. So if we were to, and so at that time, people hear, hearing that idea would say, that's crazy. You're telling me things I can't see are causing death. That's stupid and crazy. So if we were to say the same thing about us, if the future, if the 25th century could whisper into our ear, what would they say? And my hypothesis is they would say, Psst, don't die that don't die is the most played game in human history. Every is the most played game by every human on planet Earth every second of every day. It's the most played game in the world, more so than religion, more so than capitalism. It's the fundamental thing we each do every second of every day. And that's what I'm saying. That is the one thing that we as a species can align on that we breathe every few seconds. We look both ways before we cross the street. We throw out moldy food. We do things every day to not die. I never consider this don't die as a game, but you're absolutely right. Okay, so if I want to not die, okay, okay, let's say I'm totally with you. What can I do? Because you said slow down the process, which I think I understand, but you also said reverse the process. Yeah. It seems, 
I even can't grasp it. What do you mean? You're going to be younger in 10 years than what you are now. You're going to be uh, wiser. You're going to be older, like, like in your ID passport, but you're going to be younger in what parameters, in what metrics? Yeah. Over the past three years, I have become the most biologically measured person in human history. And what we did is we said, we're going to approach me as, a, as a, an intelligent being differently. We're going to measure every one of my organs. And then we're going to ask each organ, heart, lungs, liver, pancreas, brain, what do you need to be your best self? We're then going to search the scientific literature and say, what can we do? Now, we know fundamentally, if you look at a baby's heart and a 90-year-old heart, they look different and they function different. There's clear signs of aging. And so you can look at my heart and say, what does my heart look like? And what does it function like? And you can assign it an age score. Right now, it's 37. So then you go to the scientific literature and you say, what can you do to change what my heart looks like and functions like? Can you change diet? Can you do exercise? Can you do certain medications? You have all these opportunities in front of you to change the anatomical structure and functional nature of your heart. And we've done that with every single one of my organs. And so over the past three years, what I've endeavored to show is you can indeed uh, quantify the biological age of every organ of the body. You can use scientific evidence and then try to slow those aging processes and or reverse it and verify we do so through measurement. Okay, so two questions. One, this is very, uh, again, from, in my opinion, my I, I, not educated opinion, yes, but it's not a holistic approach because you treat each organ separately, independently. And I think that you also agree with me that the body is a very holistic system. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how can we re re reconcile the idea of treating each organ separately with the concept of holistic body? And yeah. the second thing is, is there a ideal age that you want to that we want to strive for for example in the function of the heart i want to be 25 but in the kidneys i would like to be i would like to be i i, I don't know 27 or what is the ideal age or maybe yeah. we you have many ideal ages yeah uh, <clears throat> on the first one we do measure holistic system markers so for example my cardiovascular capacity is in the top 1.5% of 18-year-olds. My speed of aging, as shown by my DNA methylation, is better than 86% of 18-year-olds. Of so outside of, of individual organs, we do measure whole body system uh, markers. And then in terms of the specific age, for each marker, there's an age minimum. So for example, with bone mineral density, age min, I believe, is 30 and in that, I'm in the top 0.02 percentile. I'm in the top 99.8 percentile for bone mineral density for 30-year-olds, which is the age min for that test. For cardiovascular capacity, uh, we peak at age 18. So every biomarker has an optimal age that we try to strive for. And that's when basically when the aging process commences, we're trying to get back to peak youthfulness. Wow. Okay. I think that we don't have much time. Uh, so I maybe have just two last questions. One, yeah. okay, you donated your living body to science and you did it again. You are the most biology, uh, you, you must measure human being in the history of planet Earth. But what can be, uh, what can I extract or get or gain from your journey, even yeah. though I am not? the most measurable, uh, measured human being in the, in planet, in the history yeah. of planet Earth. Yeah, lucky you and everyone else who is listening. I have spent millions of dollars on this protocol. I've had a team of dozens of doctors. I've made everything for free for everyone. So all of my data, all of the recipes, all the protocols, everything is for free. On and your so website? You don't need it on my website. Oh. You don't need to spend $2 million a year. Uh, it's about a thousand dollars a month or so for the groceries and the supplements and you're getting good sleep. Uh, you can do on your own and getting exercise. You can also do on your own, but yeah, I've tried to make this available to the entire world at no cost. Okay. So, and, and <laughs> so it seems that Jacob and Abraham and Isaac didn't follow this procedure. So if we take the Bible uh, at, at its word 
and they lived to 120, they did some something profoundly different. So mm-hmm. maybe there is another way, okay, if we take the Bible word for word, that can say, you know, maybe there is another way that we can get to those ages. Have you ever considered like the other Bibleistic approach mm-hmm. for longevity? Let's do the experiment. Okay. And my last question, uh, we have consequences for everything that we do. You know, Ju- Jurassic Park is a good fictional example, but we have more realistic examples. But And medicine today saved people that would have died otherwise. Okay. I think it was uh, Francis Galton who said that natural selection doesn't apply to human beings anymore. And it was in the 19th century. And when we do something so profoundly important and, 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 and bra- gra- groundbreaking like longevity, maybe we are not fully, fully understand or aware to the consequences that are going to uh, appear or show up later on. So if you can please just give me your perspective on the unknown consequences of this, uh, yeah. this expedition. The- the, the best example is that is that um, in New York City, they had an existential problem of horse manure because horse, horses were the primary mode of transport. There was so much horse manure that it was causing polluted water. It was in the Hudson. It was very, it just broke down society. And nobody knew what to do about this existential problem. And then Henry Ford created the Model T and all the horse manure went away. So it ended up that the problem they were worried about wasn't actually the problem they should be concerned about. Now, the car ended up causing all sorts of problems, but the question always comes back, have we properly identified the things we should be worried about? And that is one of the hardest games in existence. Is That's that's (laughs) fortune-telling. So there are people who are in the fortune-telling business. I'm in the don't-die business. That if, if you're not dead... You get to keep on solving problems. If you're dead, you don't. And again, don't die is the world's largest game humanity have ever played, and it it plays it every day, all day long. Brian Johnson, thank you so much for your wisdom, for your journey, for con- contributing your uh, body to science. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, friend. Good to be here. Okay. Bye bye.